at just 72 kilometers per hour. One of these cars is being lifted off the road, and the other is being pushed down into it. They're both GTRs, they're both from Nissan, but they were designed 20 years apart. And when I ran CFD simulations on them, the difference in aerodynamic philosophy was impossible not to see. This isn't about one being bad, it's about how much engineering has evolved. When people talk about the GTR, they usually talk about engines, drivetrains, or lap times. But at high speed, none of that matters if the car doesn't feel stable. Aerodynamics decides whether a car feels planted or nervous, whether you trust it at 250 km per hour or back off. And that's where the difference between these two cars really starts. The R32 Skyline was designed in the late 1980s, when computational aerodynamics barely existed. Wind tunnel time was limited, and wind tunnel test methods were too. The underbody aero was almost non-existent, and stability came second to cooling and reliability. This wasn't a bad design. It was the reality of the era. What's more, it had to have the cool 80s look we all love. I ran CFD simulations on both cars under the same conditions. Same speed, same assumptions. This lets us exactly see how the air is behaving. And more importantly, where the forces are coming from. And what happens to the flow over the R32 explains why Nissan had to completely rethink aerodynamics for the R35. Let's start with the R32. To understand why the R32 behaves the way it does at speed, we need to look at how air actually moves over the car. One quick note before we dive in, this R32 simulation was actually commissioned by one of your amigos, Matthew. He wanted to understand how the R32 really behaves aerodynamically, so this analysis exists because of him. If you'd like us to run CFD on your very own car, there's a link to commission simulations on my website. Now, let's look at what the airflow is actually doing. The easiest place to start is with velocity. This is a vertical slice straight down the middle of the R32. What stands out immediately is how much the airflow slows down as it hits the base of the windshield. That slowdown means pressure is building up right there. And when we move half a meter off the center line, the picture doesn't really improve too much. The flow is still separating and it's still losing energy. This tells us that this is a body shape issue. If we switch from velocity to pressure, the story becomes even clearer. Higher pressure forms at the windshield base and continues halfway up the glass. That high pressure creates more drag as it pushes the car back, but as a positive, it also creates more downforce here as it pushes the car into the road. This flow deceleration occurs for two reasons. The first is that the windshield and hood make too sharp an angle together. They're not blended into each other much. The second reason is that the windshield is quite flat across. That reduces how well the flow can travel from the front to around the sides. That's why we also get high pressure in this left plane too. If the edges were just rounded a little more, that would help alleviate this high pressure. Now, let's look at what happens closer to the ground. At 20 centimeters off the ground, the flow under the car is slow and disorganized in some places. But for a car designed in an era where completely exposed underbodies were normal, it's actually pretty decent still. There are still some high energy flows, as you can see by the dynamic pressure plot here. That's why in the center plane, there are regions of high speed flow and regions of low speed flow. Unfortunately here though, the diffuser is exposed to very slow speed flow. It doesn't help that it's not well designed either. There's no real slant upwards, but that was the extent of aerodynamic design back then. A decent diffuser would dramatically improve this car's aerodynamics. Very little is done to control the front wheel wakes either. There are huge, low energy flows coming off of them. And that translates into a lot of drag produced, particularly lower down. However, while the front wheels aren't impressive, the rear wheels are. For a car that's 40 years old, 
the rear wheel wakes and drag are actually a little better than a typical car these days. Some of that has to do with the wake from the front wheels engulfing them, so there isn't as much energy to waste on them. But another reason is that wheels back then were smaller. That naturally lowers their drag. These days, it's not uncommon to see 18 inch rims. Back then, 15 inches were big. As such, the wheels, which are some of the greatest drag producers on a car, are minimized. The only easy improvement that could be going on here is by having a more closed rim. But other than that, they're very good. And that shows in this horizontal plane too, where we do get pockets of high speed flow under the diffuser. If the diffuser were designed better, it could take advantage of that. Moving higher up, the front wheels are still a menace, however the rear sides of the car are very good. In fact, these rear sides are better than a lot of cars these days too. The flow says attached over them, and you can see how that leads it to being shot inwards behind the car. That leads to a smaller wake and less drag here. While this middle section is awesome, moving up to around the cabin height, we see a major problem with the skyline. The rear window is right on the edge between being fine and not being fine. We can see that there is some flow separation behind it, as shown by the blue slow flow. These regions correspond to low pressure, which pulls the car back and increases the drag. But what's more, they also correspond to low dynamic pressure too, low kinetic energy flow. You don't want that either, primarily because right behind the rear window is the rear wing. Now, ordinarily, this rear wing's height would be good. It would be out of the slow, low energy flow. Here though, it's not. It's very high up, and yet, it's still on the border. Because this rear window is sloped down so much, the flow struggles to stay attached over it. That then creates these wakes and low energy flow. That then directly feeds the rear wing with this low energy flow too. We need to remember that the amount of lift a wing can produce is directly proportional to the velocity squared. What that means is, if you feed the wing with half the speed, it won't generate half the downforce, it'll generate a quarter of the downforce. This rear window is not only greatly increasing the drag as we see here, it's also reducing the downforce. To see if this problem can be easily fixed, we ran a simulation on this car with vortex generators. We'll cover the results of that in a later video. If we zoom out and look at the full streamlined orbit, two regions stand out to me. The air flowing over the A-pillars detaches, we can see that in the velocity plot too. That creates more drag. Then the air rolls up over the C-pillars and vortices are formed here too. That also increases the drag. Putting all of this together, and the picture is consistent. High pressure on top, weak flow underneath, poor diffuser design, low energy flow feeding the rear wing, that all adds up to lift, not downforce. And this is the exact problem Nissan solved with the R35. Same idea, completely different solution. Let's look at what changed. With the R35, Nissan approached aerodynamics with a completely different set of priorities. Not just reducing drag, but proactively controlling the airflow around and underneath the car. Looking at the centerline velocity plane, the first thing that stands out is how clean the flow is. The flow underneath the car has greatly improved. It's not perfect, but much better. There's also a proper diffuser. Because the flow underneath has been improved, the diffuser is fed with higher energy flow too. It does a great job kicking the flow up. The wake size is very small, and so the drag drops. As a result of all of this, we get good low pressure almost along the entire length of the underbody. That's producing downfalls. The rear window has been greatly improved too. It is sloped down nicely. That keeps the flow faster. However, a thick green layer of slow flow still exists. This is partly because no matter what you do, you'll get this layer to some extent.
but also because the rear wing is mounted so low. From a wing's performance point of view, this rear wing is mounted too low, it suffers the same problem as the Skyline, it's exposed to slow, low energy flow. As such, it won't produce as much downforce as it could. But that doesn't mean that it isn't producing downforce. Looking at the pressure plot, we can see this red high pressure region forming ahead of it. That occurs because the flow over the rear window is impacting the rear wing. That pushes back up and decelerates the flow. Some of that flow's energy is now turned into this high pressure. That high pressure then pushes the car down. Downforce. Overall, this rear wing is producing downforce, just not in an efficient way. It's more how a rear spoiler produces a downforce. The GTR kept the good rear sides that the Skyline had too. The flow says attached over them, it then shoots inwards behind the car. That reduces the wake size and the drag produced. This is one of the few cars that lives up to its hype. Many performance cars are overhyped, some budget cars are underhyped, this car is adequately hyped. When we look at the full streamlined orbit, the R35 is definitely improved. The flow over the A pillar is straighter, not in danger of separating and creating drag. The flow over the C pillars is better too. It does still skew up and look like it's on the edge of rolling up into vortices, but it's still fine and no drag is produced here. So the difference here just isn't better numbers. It's a completely different philosophy. Instead of accepting lift as a byproduct of speed, the R35 uses airflow to generate stability. That change in design came about through 20 years of improved aerodynamics. Now that we've seen how the airflow behaves, let's look at what that actually means in terms of drag and vertical force. Under the same conditions, the R32 Skyline produces a drag coefficient of 0.41. The R35 GTR comes in at 0.31. At 72 km per hour, the R32 produces 9.9 .9 kilos of lift. At the same speed, the R35 produces 8.2 kilos of downforce. That's not just a difference in magnitude, it's a difference in direction. If you're interested in learning more about automotive aerodynamics, I teach a full automotive aerodynamics course here. Aerodynamically, these two cars are solving completely different problems. The R32 prioritizes cool 80s looks. The R35 prioritizes airflow control. That difference shows up long before you even reach extreme speeds. Lift reduces tire loading, which reduces grip and stability. Downforce does the opposite. And that doesn't mean the R32 is poorly designed. It means it was designed in a time when aerodynamic downforce on road cars simply wasn't a priority, especially not without a big drag penalty. The R35 shows what happens when you combine computational tools, wind tunnel development, and a clear aerodynamic target. You reduce drag and gain stability. And once you've seen how the airflow behaves, those numbers make perfect sense. What this really shows is how powerful aerodynamic tools have become. As a side note, I also have open foam courses focused specifically on setting up and running CFD simulations. That's more technical, but it's the tool chain behind everything in this video. When you can see the airflow, you can control it. If you enjoy data-driven car analyses like this, consider subscribing. Peace out, amigos.